There we go. Praise God. There's a spider up here. Not anymore. <laughs> now he's on the edge of my book. Um, this morning, friends, this morning, in, in all seriousness, um, this is going to be something this morning that you're going to take away. Um, it, there's so much material in the concept. The concept's rather simple, but it is so profound. And I really hope and pray that the Holy Spirit is going to stretch us and challenge us in our thinking. Every one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is speaking. He says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He continues in the same theme, but it actually takes a little bit of a change. It says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The title of this morning's message is Be Careful in Judgment of Others. Um, have people ever frustrated you? No. I mean, seriously, have you ever had someone in your life, you just scratch their head, your head, and you go, Are you for real? Because they are so out there in one way or another. I mean, you just. Do one of those numbers, man, they just bug you. They just really, you know, it's like you've only got one nerve left and they're standing on it. Kind of a deal. Um, they're mean. I commented to you on the trip to Alaska, uh, Jay and I would always just get so frustrated with road construction. Um, uh, there was always there and um, people were like, but this, the passing zone was always crazy because this person here is holding up the traffic, right? You get to the passing lane, so he'd go in the right lane, but he'd step on it. So all these people who are waiting to go by him, now they got to be going 90, and it's like as soon as he gets back in the passing lane, he's right back to the speed limit. It's like... Do some of you do that? <laughs> is that some of you? We were going through a construction zone. We stopped up front, or we stopped backways, and the, and the uh, flag holder waved us up. So we went up there, and they said, hey, while you're in Canada, uh, you just need to know this. When you come into road construction stuff, we want you to come to the front. We want motorcycles to come to the front. It's just safer for you and all that. So we're like, wow. And then she did say, now listen, when you're coming through the long line of people are waiting, you might get some bad looks and dirt because they don't know this, but we want you as motorcycles to go to the front couple of reasons. Number one, it's safer. Secondly, usually when the traffic does get going again, you're gone. You're, you're like not even in anybody's way. And it's really true. We're gone. It's like we were never there. One construction site we came to, it was a rather big one. Uh, we pulled up to the front. And again, there's a few people gave us some dirty looks because there was a long line. And we go up to the front. We pull over. Lady greets us. Good to see you here. It was, everything was fine. But it was a rather lengthy road construction where we're waiting for the pilot car because one big item of traffic coming the other direction got stuck on the road because of what they were doing. Okay, Jay, you remember this? Yeah. We're waiting there quite a long time. And there's this one guy. 
he just comes storming up the other side, and, and the poor flag holder, he just comes uncorked on her. What is going on? How come it takes so long? It's just backing up like crazy back there. Them people have been through twice, and motorcycles and everything, they're just coming up here, and he was just blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking to myself, poor sir, you have just revealed to everybody who you are, and you have no clue. You're a donkey's backside. <laughs> it, but you have no clue. No, have you ever thought about some of the stuff that people do? It's like, I really, I, I really wanted to, because it's just in my nature, to, to follow him back to his car. <laughs> and I'd like to say to administer the love of Jesus, but it wasn't that. <laughs> It wasn't anything bad either. I really just wanted to ask him a couple questions just to make him think. I'd like to try to make people think once in a while. Sometimes I do it in a good way. Sometimes I don't do it in such a good way. I'd like to ask him, say, excuse me, sir, but I really want to ask you a question. You look like a, a rather intelligent guy. I, I just honestly, by your going up there and talking to her, what were you hoping what, what effect were you hoping for? Really? Do you think she had the power to just, you know, all these people have been waiting here long enough. I don't care what's going on up there. I'm sending them through. I mean, is that what you wanted her to do? What were you thinking she could do? There are so many times in our lives it would be very good for us to just zip. It's nobody's fault. No one's to blame. It's just this phrase, it is what it is. It is what it is was on our bulletin board last week, and I went into Napa, and Napa helps support our car show. They donate $200, they have the last few years, just donated to our car show. So I went in there to ask them if they'd like to support the car show again. And um, when I walked in, because I haven't been there in a while, because I was gone for a while, and a couple of the guys behind the counter says, Pastor Mike, it's so good to see you. We have a, we have a spiritual question to ask you. That's never happened when I've walked into Napa before. <laughs> I walked in and, he, and the guy says, what is the spiritual significance of it is what it is? <laughs> I have to admit, I didn't, I didn't have an answer. I said, I don't know. I saw it on our board too and I thought the same thing. <laughs> Friends, this idea of Truly, we, we really honestly, every one of us, you and I both, there's so many situations in our life. If the highest calling for us is to, to love people, we have got to really understand that we're all different. I mean, really different. And every once in a while, some of the badness in all of us is displayed by this guy coming up, and I just, you know, it's probably not in his nature. Maybe it is, I don't know, but again, giving him the measure I want to be judged against is the measure that I judge him with. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, maybe he was just having one of those really bad days. Maybe he needed a toilet and there was none to be found. You, you, you don't know. I mean, I, I was stranded on the highway one time because of a bad accident for two, for two hours. And um, the woods were very welcomed by everybody. I have to admit, after saying all that, this issue is complicated because our master, Jesus, who taught us to be kind, to be careful not to judge others, he kind of throws us a curveball. Last week we read in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, it says, He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at them 
at their stubborn hearts. So we read that and we go, well, he looked around in anger at them. And in Mark chapter 9, verses 17 through 19, we see another thing that just kind of shocks us. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? I mean, he was just frustrated. Uh, this guy brought his son who was uh, demon-possessed. The, the apostles couldn't cast him out. And he, so he brings him to Jesus. And Jesus is just, you see this, how long shall I stay with you? How long will I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. You guys are all so incompetent. Bring him here. I'll take care of it. Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? You see this disappointment, this frustration. Ooh, I was reading in Matthew, right? I told you Mark. Yeah. Oops. I'll get there in a minute. I'm giving you opportunity to practice what I preach. Mark chapter 9, I was in Matthew. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 through 19. You guys just sat there and listened to rather politely, though. You didn't interrupt me and say, hey, hey, hey. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 through 19. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit and has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. It foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out, but he could not. You unbelieving generation. How long will... That's the same story. I guess it didn't really matter where I read it from, did it? That's why you didn't say anything. That's good. Because it was the same story. Oh, I love it. That is really, really good. I'm going to fix that before second service. Ten. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Jesus also, if you think about what he did in his ministry time here, not only did he have these instances here where he was just frustrated, said, how long have I got to put up with you? You know, um, looking at them in anger. But he also called, he called some people whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, a brood of vipers, fools, snakes, simple called them children of the devil. He said, if you make a convert, you make him twice as much a, a child of hell as you are. Called some people dogs. It's like, wow. I don't know about you, but that seems, like I said, really incredibly harsh. I don't have time, and nor would I try to go through all the ramifications of it except for to understand this and I'm not going to get into this part a lot in our passage of scripture this morning in Matthew in the beginning it says do not judge or you too will be judged the emphasis of that front part is for in the same way you judge others it will be judged against you here's the thing Jesus had the right to judge people and use the judgment of perfection if you will of righteousness, knowing the motives of men's hearts. You and I rarely have the opportunity to judge people from a point, standpoint of perfection. You and I rarely, if ever, have an uh, uh, opportunity to judge people's motives. And there's where there is a little bit of difference. Because in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 7, he says, Don't give dogs what is sacred problem is you and I rarely can identify a dog we don't know who's close to salvation and who's truly evil again 
we make those judgments and there's times for them. You know, the thing we need to realize that the reality is for every one of us, we are at the center of normal. Every one of us, right? I mean, you're, you think you are at the very center, the very core. You think you are the most balanced, well thought out, solid person there is. Okay, so, uh, oh, this is an interesting surprise. Some of you are keenly aware of your idiosyncrasies. <laughs> you are ahead of the game. Because most of us go through life thinking that, quite honestly, your life, my life, our judgments, our opinions, our actions, our feelings, our emotions, our reactions to things are at the very center of normal. If everybody would just do it like this, wow, wouldn't life be great? Amen? Oh, you're thinking it, but you're not going to say amen. But you think that, it's like, oh yeah, I think so. We think we're right. We think we're healthy. It's like, wow. Julie, my lovely assistant this morning, could you come and help me? You know, I don't know where to put this. I think I'm going to put it right here. Well, the pulpit, unfortunately, some of you up front can't see it. Um, second service, maybe we can turn the camera on, put the camera on, image up onto the trons. See, we really plan these things out, just so you know. Um, it really doesn't matter. We'll guess like that. That'd be really good. A little cool. Okay, now I need two volunteers. You know, the people in the back always think they're safe. <laughs> you know, you sit back here because you're like, well, he's not going to really come this far back, is he? Well, yeah, he really could. How about if we pick on a couple of ladies? Would you two please join me? Come front and center. Give them a hand. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> okay, know this. You're going to be safe. It's going to be, come on up. It's going to be good. This is not going to be that terribly difficult. Or, or he's standing one over here, one right over here. Please do me a favor. Uh, put one of your, take a hand, stick it right in there. Your hand, if you could roll this up a little bit. You don't want to get it wet. What is your name? Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi. How long have you been coming to Maranatha? A month. A month? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Isn't this great? It's interesting. Yeah. And your name is? Nancy. Hi, Nancy. How long have you been coming? Keep your hand in there. I know it's really hot. Yeah, it is really yeah, hot. Well, can we not get hurt? You? Hey, boil, water boils at like 212 degrees. Isn't right. that right? This isn't 212. No, it's not even close. Go ahead. Suck it in there. Go ahead. Suck it in there. Go ahead. Just... Can I try this one? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Go okay. in there. Go in there. Okay, just leave your hand there for a minute. How are you feeling? Chilly. It's a little chilly, getting, getting a little numb. Want to switch? Uh, you're going <laughs> to... You can you know, Yeah, this one here is... This is definitely uncomfortable. Yeah. That one there is going to be uncomfortable if I leave you li much longer. You're going to make it? Sure. Okay. You are cheating. <laughs> you are cheating. Is, is it, like, like, really painful? It's really hot. It's really hot. Come on. Do you like it? That's not hot. <laughs> In fact, did you hear me whisper to Julie as she walked away? I said, oh, it's kind of cooled down a little bit. That's not hot. Oh, that's right. Your feminine, dainty hands. <laughs> well, they were really cold uh, on the way here. So they were cold. This so this feels extreme. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll leave it in there for another, another 10 seconds. Just 10 okay. seconds straight. There you go. 10 seconds. It'll get used to it. Yeah. Doesn't mean I like it, though. No, I know. Okay. Since, since you're whining the most... Yeah, so I get to go in there now. You get to go in there first. Thank you. Okay, go in there. Okay, now compared to where you were, how does that feel? Good. Hot or cold? It feels cold. It feels cold. Yeah. It does. It okay. Does. Okay, you can take your hand out now unless you want to leave it in there, but Carla's hand's coming in there next. No, it's better. <laughs> okay, Carla, go ahead and put your hand in there. Compared to where you were, is that hot or cold? It's a little warmer. 
It, it's warm, yeah, a little warmer. Okay, now what's really interesting is this water here is supposed to be like 120 degrees. I don't think it is. It might have been that when it started. Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore, not uh -huh. even close. That would have been painful. Yeah. Second service is going to be painful. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here then. For whoever's hand goes in there, it's going to be like 120 degrees, at least. Where's Julie? At least 120. Where is she? 120 degrees at least. Um, this right here is room temperature. That's around 72 degrees, that, that water right there. This water here is about 40 degrees. With ice in ice water, it's around 40 degrees. Now, um, from where you came from, you said this was cold, and you said it was hot. Your judgments, your perception of the same water had different outcomes. A lot because of where you've been. I wish everybody, I could do this to you, but I can't. Would you guys give them a hand as they go back down? Thank you so much for coming up here. Thank you. You know, friends, we, simple little illustration. But you know, these bowls here represent our lives. Like I said, this one's about 120 degrees, or supposed to be. This one's 40 degrees. This one here is 72. These bowls represent our lives. Our past experiences shape who we are. I mean, experiences, you know, never realized. There was a young man one time that was at a youth camp, and I kind of really bonded to this, this young kid, big guy, for a teenager, for a high schooler. Altar call would be given, and he'd just sit there. I'd, I'd scooch you over to him and say, man, Tom, just give your life to Jesus, man. What are you, what, what are you waiting for? Just, why don't you just go forward and give your life to Jesus? Come on, you and I have talked a lot. You, 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 you believe it. You understand it. I know you want to. Next night, same thing. Next night, same thing. Next night, same thing. I go up and I'm, I'm pleading with him. Man, your friends, they've all went up there and given his life to the Lord. And he made this really just strange comment out of the blue. It took me by surprise. He said, everybody who goes up there cries. And I, and I, I mean, I remember it caught me so off guard. I just, well, so you cry. I mean, that's not a big deal. And I could see by his rea my, my words, his reaction, he tightened up just a little bit more. And I realized something's not right. He's got this crying thing, something. So I'm pleading with him, man, let's go. I'll go with you, you know. Let's just go forward. Man, if you cry, you cry. I said, what's the deal with crying? He said, one day, when he was younger, he was like nine or ten. He came into the room where his dad was sitting, he was, and he was crying because he got hurt. He said, my dad kicked me in the face with his boot, sent me across the floor, and said, men don't cry. I was like, oh. I quickly changed tactics, obviously. I said, listen, you don't got to go forward, but you need to accept Christ. Can we accept Christ right here, right now? Would you make a long story? He did, and he cried, and it was good. I told him it was fine. It was... But you know, friends, when you and I meet people, we have no idea of what has, what has made them and shaped them to be the people that they are. One of the things I tell the staff oftentimes, remember, when you're dealing with people... And you know, they come in, there's a situation over else, and, and not you all, I'm talking about newer people, because this doesn't fit you, but I, I tell them all the time, remember this, not everybody is psychologically square. Not everybody is healthy or normal. The biggest mistake you will make is assuming that everybody is. Because every one of us carry through this life a certain amount of baggage or perception and whatever and our bowls representing our lives are shaped by a whole lot of things 
Let me just mention a couple. Um, and let, let's just go right straight, straight to some people's lives are affected by prescription. There's genuine mental illness. I remember Orlean worked at a home for adults that were uh, mentally challenged. And, and most of them, not by birth, but by horrible circumstances. Most of them abused terribly as children, sexually and physically and emotionally. And they just, something snapped. And, and they live now in a home. She worked there for a while. And I would occasionally go visit, you know, had permission to go visit and, and be there and see the people. And, and, and some of the people, you'd look at them, by just looking at them, they look like OJ. You'd have no idea. No. <laughs> So I want to make sure you're paying attention. Some of them quite looked, honestly, they, they, I mean, there wasn't a sign on their head or forehead. They just, they looked. Other people, it was more obvious. Just by physical traits. Mental illness. When you're dealing with somebody, are they off their meds? Are they on their meds? You don't know. I was standing in Walmart this was a few years back. I'm standing in Walmart getting ready to pay. And I'm just standing. There's a woman up there that's having, an, 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 you know, t doing her deal with the cashier. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, this woman turns to me and says, you took my dollar. I want my dollar back. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what to say. I mean, I... I wasn't going to defend myself because that sounded like it was just I, I did not know what to say and then she got more insistent I saw you you took my dollar I want my dollar back I, I looked at her I looked at the cashier the cashier looked at her cashier looked at me and we both are like eh? I don't know I, I just, excuse me man, I, I didn't take your dollar I saw you you took and now she's getting louder I'm like oh my god this is Walmart. This is like Maranatha too, you know? <laughs> Everybody's looking over there and wondering why Pastor Mike would steal a dollar from a poor innocent woman. <laughs> why would he steal her dollar? There's Pavlov's dog. Friends, every one of uh, you and I need to realize that when we meet people, that every one of us have con been conditioned. We have a conditioned response to things. Um, it's, it's interesting whenever I talk about sexuality, seeing some of our reactions. I, I know I, I pushed the edge. Some of you, it's just, it, you just, it's never, you know what to do with it. And I'm not trying to say that I don't at times push too far. Talk about rock and roll music. Whether you want to talk about whether smoking or drinking, dancing, what, whatever the topic might be, you all bring into it an experience of what you think is right, normal, and whatever. I mean, I, I remember we in the old building, we had square dancers that used to dance every Friday night. They'd come in there and they'd have a dance. How many of you remember that? You remember that? Well, one night we had booked a Speed the Light uh, banquet in the chapel area, in the sanctuary area. Um, that's where the square dancers would come in and do their square dancing. Well, there was this guy from South Texas. He was the guest speaker. And Brother St. John is there and all the other, uh, some of the churches from the section were all in there having this great banquet. This poor pastor from South Texas, he was having conniptions. Grab your partner, swing her around. What? And he, 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 he just, he was furious. Complained to Brother St. John. Brother St. John is the district superintendent. Our district superintendent was fine. He understands it's, you know, it's, it's a building. It gets used for a lot of things. But to him, this was the house of God, and you're allowing the house of God. Pavlov's dog, what conditioned response have we been trained for? And it affects, friends, you all have them in your life. I have them in my life. We need to be more tolerant and patient. Be careful how you judge, because the judgment you use will be the measure that will be used against you. Then there's just personality. Wow, isn't that a can of worms? <laughs> just this idea of personality. I mean, some of you are risk takers. Others of you, man, super safe. I tell everybody that when Orlean and I got married, I made her life interesting. She helped make my life safer. 
Okay? Everyday life is exciting enough for her. For me, if, some, if, if somebody doesn't come close to death, I'm kind of bored sometimes. I mean, it needs to be an experience where let's build a jump. And Samson was just a little, I mean, he's five years old. Good thing mom didn't know what I was about to do with him. <laughs> We went out to the old church in a little mini bike that he really should not have been on. But you know, it's like, oh, that's going to be cool. Sonny, put a helmet on him. And okay, just take off and just enjoy this. <laughs> it's amazing anybody survives childhood. No, no, some parents would, would oh, I can't, again, we're, everybody's a little different. And he, bah, and whoa. <laughs> <clears throat> That might explain a little bit of why he is the way he is, you know, today. Um, some, of you just, some of you, again, you, you see these skydivers and you go, why would somebody do that? That's insane. It's, and to somebody who's doing it, it's like it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, we're all just different. Personalities. Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Um, a book by David Kersey, please understand me. And, I, and I'm going to give you just a couple of these references um, when I'm done. I think this, honestly, is a book that, if you've never read it, you really should. It'll make you more effective in your family, more effective in your job, more effective as a person. Especially, I think, it'll make us more effective as Christians. If you do not want what I want, please try not to tell me that my want is wrong. If my beliefs are different from yours, at least pause before you set out to correct them. If my emotion seems less or more intense than yours, given the same circumstances, try not to ask me to feel other than I do. On the police officer appreciation, you notice how they, they commented, you know, police officers have been caught laughing at some pretty times where you shouldn't be laughing. And they're, hey, we, again, don't judge them. We do not understand their world. They de-stress. They see horrible things. And, and they, if they don't make light of it, they'll go crazy. A parent dies. One laughs, one cries. Tragedy happened. I mean, just because someone does not react to the same thing the way you do, know this. Neither of them are crazy. Or if I act or fail to act in a manner of your design for action, please let me be. I do not for the moment at least ask you to understand me. That will come only when you are willing to give up trying to change me into a copy of you. If you will allow me any of my own wants, emotions, beliefs, actions, then you open yourself up to the possibility that someday these ways of mine might not seem so wrong and might finally appear as right for me. To put up with me is the first step to understanding me. Not that you embrace my ways as right for you, but that you are no longer irritated or disappointed with me for my seeming waywardness. And one day, perhaps in trying to understand me, you might come to prize my differences. And as far as from seeking to change me, you might preserve and even cherish those differences for the things that I can do that you don't. This book, he, it goes on in this, this talks about our, our, our personality types, our temperaments. Um, well, there is the temperaments, the sanguine the melancholy, the choleric, choleric, and the phlegmatic. Um, it, it, you, you, you all, or we all, are one of those. It defines who we are. We see things and we react to things differently. In, in this book here, uh, the Myers-Briggs evaluation analyzes the different personality types that we are. It's incredible. And so many times, you and I want to moralize over what somebody did or said or how they react, when quite honestly, it's not oftentimes so much a spiritual thing as much as a personality thing. But we want to moralize everything and say, well, you know, that OJ, if he would just grow spiritual a little bit, he wouldn't act that way, or he wouldn't think this way, or he wouldn't... Re you know. No. 
The four major categories are the SPs, the SJs, the NFs, and the NTs. And believe me, I really don't have time to get into this. That's why I would suggest the book. They have a test in here. You can find out um, what your, your personality type is. And then in the back, you can read how screwed up you really are. <laughs> you can find out just exactly how screwed up you are. Okay? Because um, we all are, according to somebody who's on the opposite side of the scale of us. Somebody who's extremely conservative sees me as this wild, reckless, crazy person. Until another wild, reckless, crazy person sees me and goes, when are you going to start doing something? <laughs> Under those four categories, there's four subcategories. So there's 16 major personality types. I'll just read eight to you. The expressive, the observant, the tough-minded, the scheduling, the reserved, the introspective, the friendly, the probing. I mean, the, it, it's just really cool stuff. That we all ought to be aware of, because when Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, which is usually through the lens of our own personality our own perspectives, our own Pavlov's dog's experience, conditioned responses. We take all that and we try to moralize that, well, I am normal. No, this. That's cold, especially after touching this. Oh, no, it's really warm. Oh, wait a minute, it's the same. It just depends on who you are. There's person, okay, there's prescriptions, Pavlov's dog, personality. Then it's just preference. And some of this comes down to your personality, just preference. Some like knitting, some like kayaking. Some like bowling, some like bull riding. Some like to go naked and afraid. <laughs> How many of you, you've seen the show or you've, you're aware that the show's out there? These people, they send out naked... I, I don't know. I look at that and I go, what? What? Hey, but does that... It's just not my deal. I don't... I, let's move on. <laughs> you know, some of these preferences, some of these differences in, in our mind... Oh, my goodness, I'm supposed to be done. Some of these differences in our lives are, are, are just generational. And again, we want to moralize on them... Um, Long hair. Remember, remember when long hair came? It was when the Beatle invasion happened. These Beatles, these four guys from London, from England, from London, came, and they were like, oh, and they had long hair. It was down to here. You should go back and look. In the 1960s, the early 60s, when they came, what was considered long hair, it was down here. It wasn't shaved up like this. It was, and they had long hair. Wait until the 70s, 60s, and 70s get here, right? Now we're going to see long hair. God, we all like to pick out our own personal preferences and try to judge others and say, well, this is right, this is wrong, and... I have found, I don't know about you, but there's three things that really need to temper us and shape us when we, this idea of judging others. When Jesus says, the same measure you use will be used against others. Okay, three things. Number one, I have re noticed the general rule of humanity is you and I tend to make fun of or ridicule that which we do not understand. Okay? Uh, I don't understand golf. I've come to appreciate that golf is a highly skilled uh, game. I mean, it, it, it takes dedication. It takes, but for me, I'm just so, uh, so, so I make fun of it. And I, you know, I'd rather, you know, ride a motorcycle and risk my life than play with a little ball, beat it around the field all day. Uh, quite, horses, I don't understand horses. They scare me. So why do these people ride these horses and they jump over? I mean, we make fun of 
We tease that which we do not understand. When you start to understand, again, all the work and why do people sit in like why do people sit in front of a TV and watch cars go round in a circle? When I hear that, I want to beat you up. <laughs> do you realize the time, the skill, the energy? The, sometimes you're talking about a quarter inch or a quarter pound of pressure in a tire to help the steering and the, and the rebounding and how's the chassis set up and all the different things and the crew and they're there and the, they're, they're side drafting and they're, they're going 200 miles an hour bumper to bumper side by side and the focus and the, how can you say how can you watch these cars go wrong because you don't understand it. You, you don't know all the things that are involved. Friends, that is the nature of every one of us. We tend to ridicule or mock that which we didn't understand. Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. Okay, number two. Oh, man, I really got to be done, don't I? Really quick. The three, the three judgment tests. The three the three question test of judgment bottom line when you look at it is it illegal is it unscriptural and is it immoral if it's none of those chalk it up to personal preference why don't you just say you know I would never do that Pastor Mike I would never say that way I would never do that I would you know yeah well I would or you would if it's not illegal unscriptural or immoral Take two steps back, take a deep breath, and just go, oh. Number three. Number three is patience. We all need a heavy dose of patience. This idea, we'll make judgments on people, it might be just a bad day. That's not who they really are. That guy that came up in that, in that road construction, honestly, he might have been one of the most patient guys. Who knows? He was having a bad day. And we just happened to see him in one of his poorer moments. In Romans chapter 14, basically, we are urged by the Apostle Paul to do that exactly the same thing. Take a breath. Be patient. Romans chapter 14, verse 10 says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Let's, let's, let's focus and worry more about me than others. Verse 12. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or a sister. Paul in, chapter, in Romans chapter 14 is talking about meat offered to idols. He says, hey, some people's consciences are weak. That just bothers them, knowing that this meat was offered to, to false gods, and they see you walk in, buy it because it's cheaper, and you eat it. It doesn't bother you. But it just morally bothers somebody else. Like, how could you do that? And, uh, uh. and Paul says, hey, do not for the sake of these things destroy the family of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty extreme example, I think. Could you imagine if you've seen O.J. going into the temple of Baal in downtown Forest Lake? Yeah, no, poor O.J. this morning, right? <laughs> My mom's having sympathy for you. We see him go in, into the temple in downtown Forest Lake, he buys meat and he walks out. We're all going to have a tough time with that. Paul says, uh, not so much. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. And you know, that's the key. Yeah, somebody might right now might not be just doing quite, you know, I'm going to pray for him exhort him, walk alongside him, try to understand. It might have been just a bad day. We don't know if he was raised with a boot put to his face.
to judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. Because every one of us are in process. We're learning and we're growing. I don't think Lakti will make up a story again. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. As I mentioned earlier, that's the hardest things to really check. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. You ladies are very familiar with this book here. I thought it was just me, but it isn't. If you, were, if you went to the women's retreat last year, um, I was just paging through just a couple, some of the pages in here, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. You and I really, when we see people, they don't wear a placard saying, I was sexually abused. My dad kicked me in the face with a boot. Um, I, I met one time a guy, started coming to church. I started, you know, meeting with him because he was, he was kind of you know, rattled, didn't trust churches, whatever else. He told me a story. Him and his wife were having some marriage problems, so they went to this church, and the pastor was giving marriage counseling. The pastor ended up having an affair with her and stole her. He divorced his wife. She divorced him, and they ran off together. That will mess with you. This almost piggybacks with last week's message. When driving through and seeing the glory and the grandeur of God, being aware of my own wickedness, isn't it great for every one of us to throw up our arms and say, God, we are mercifully all screwed up. Amen. We think we're the center. With God, we live and move and have our being because of your grace, because of your mercy. Amen? Amen. Okay. There's a lot of things I didn't say. Well, you just have to stand up for sin because I know some of you right now are, are crying, crying. Well, you can't just accept everybody. You got to tell them when they're wrong. And you're, I, I understand all that. Like I said, today, I want to just challenge you. I want to poke you. Could we possibly look at other people with more loving kindness, with more patience? And I really want to recommend, seriously, look up this book or try to borrow Orleans, but I don't think you'll pry it from her hand. Um, and this book here, too, I thought it was just me, but it isn't. It's all about, sh it's mainly based about shame and how many of us walk and carry around so much shame in our life and how much that shapes us. And again, when you meet them, you don't see it on their face. Lord have mercy. Okay, it's 10 after. Let's not pray. Again, here, here's why. Here's why. Some of you have been so conditioned. Well, as Christians, well, we open the service with prayer. We close the service with prayer. It really wasn't church if we didn't do it. Can I tell you? You give me two minutes to tell a quick story. Okay, because we're not going to pray at the end, right? So I'm not going to take that time. Consider this my closing prayer. Yes, Mom. I'll see you later. You got to go? Why? Because you're not done. Sit down, Mother. I was in a meeting recently. I'll tell this really quick. Uh, a bunch of pastors from around the state were in this meeting. It was a, a pe the conference, and the head guy, he see me, he says, hey, Pastor Mike, would you uh, open this meeting up with prayer? And I'm, sure. Now, the meeting started at 11. We, I knew that lunch was coming. We were going to have lunch, and the meeting went until like 2 o'clock, okay? So I prayed. Oh, you should have listened to me pray. I prayed. Oh, man, it was, oh, oh it was, it, the glory came down, okay? So, so I prayed. And then I asked a blessing on the lunch that's going to be coming because I knew lunch was coming within just in an hour. Lord, but I just kind of committed the day to him. Okay, so pizza shows up. The guy sees us. He says, okay, guys, we're going to take a break. We're, we're going to break for lunch, so let's pray. He prayed everything. He prayed just like I did. He prayed for the service. He prayed for this, and he prayed for the lunch. And, and I thought to myself, I can't wait till this service is over. I said to him, I said, my dear brother, I said, I know you got big shoulders. Here's the thing. I keep getting, you know, ridiculed or, or harassed because, you know, I'm, I, I'm not very religious and whatever else. And, and I said, you know, it's because of stuff like this that you do. I said, now, do you mind if I press you a little harder? And he's a good guy. We have a relationship. Just for a learning moment, he said, yes. 
I said, when the service started, you asked me to pray. And I said, I think I did a fine job. What do you think? He says, oh, no, yeah, you prayed well. I said, so you prayed again just now. I said, why did you do that? He goes, habit? And that's my point. He did it out of habit. I said to him, I said, you know, I've been in a lot of meetings where pastors, we pray. Oh, let's pray. We pray. And friends, don't get me wrong. I'm not against praying. But, you know, we, we pray. And else, every once in a while, I want to stop him and say, excuse me, but who are you talking to? Are you just praying? Or are you going to talk to our Heavenly Father? Because if it's just out of habit and you speak words to the sky, does it really matter? I said, secondly, I said, you know something? Real often, I don't like to close a lot of meetings in prayer. Now, every Sunday we do, right? So you're going to say, Mike, you're a hypocrite. But I'd like you to think. So many times you've been in good meetings, powerful meetings, and then you, you, cl- you, you end with prayer. To me, I sense in people's spirits as I've uh, observed this, it's like putting a little ribbon on it, tying it up in a bow and saying, okay, now we're done. We set that aside. Now we can go on. There's a lot of things, like today especially, I don't want it to be done I want you and I to wrestle with and, and, and be struggling with, yeah, but Pastor Mike, you didn't say this. Or, yeah, mm, whatever that in is. Because we all need to change. We all need to grow. We all need to be stretched. And we all need to realize that people who ride horses and play golf are wimps. <laughs> okay, I don't mean that to be true. That was our sarcastic joke. Because... We, we, we all do that stuff, okay? Lord, help us. You are dismissed. Mom, now you can go. Now you can go. This had your name on it, so...